The title of the message today is, It's All About Love. It's All About Love. And the passage we want to look at is in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. His name was Kevin, Kevin Jones. He was a young college student who was kind of strange and bizarre. He wore a faded t-shirt with ragged jeans and flip-flops, and that was his entire wardrobe for four years of college. Kevin was not a Christian, but the college that he went to, right across the street from the college, there was a very conservative, well-dressed church, and they were trying their best to reach out to the college students on that university campus, and so they got this huge banner that they hung across the fronts of the church that said, College Students Welcome. Well, one Sunday morning, Bill, uh, Kevin decided, you know, I'm going to go check out this church. I'd never been to church before. I wonder what the whole thing is about. And so he didn't know anything about going to church at all. And so he wandered in a few minutes late. And when he got there that day, the church was totally full. It was packed. And he wandered in when the choir was singing their last song just before the pastor got up to teach. And so he wanders in the back door of the center aisle and he's looking around for a scene and he can't find one on his left or right anywhere. And he doesn't know what he's doing. And so he just keeps walking up the front aisle and he can't find a seat. So when he gets to the front, he just squats down right in the center aisle in the front. Well, as this crazy young kid is wandering down the aisle, Everybody's looking around at each other like, who, who is this guy? And the choir is singing. Finally, they finish their number. And when they do, it's dead silent. And there's an awkward pause in the room. And all of a sudden, way in the back, an old deacon named Albert got up. He had silver hair and a three-piece pinstripe suit. He had a cane in his hand and In the silence, you could hear the clicking of the cane as he was walking up the side aisle. And everyone that was there that day, they knew in their mind what was going on. They knew in their mind what that old man had to do. (laughs) Who was this crazy kid? He didn't really understand how it all worked. And you can't blame the old man (laughs) for being set in his old ways. And so he walked to the front. He walked right up to where Kevin was. And then, with great effort, that old man squatted down on the floor right next to Kevin. The pastor quickly made his way to the pulpit, and he said, my dear people, what I'm about to say you might never remember, but what we have all just seen we will never forget. And how could they forget? For in that moment, that old man was like God. Later they asked the old man, why did you do that? And he said, I didn't want that young man to be alone. I wanted him to know that someone loved him. What that old man did that day, he learned from another old man, an old man that lived 2,000 years ago. And that old man we know as the Apostle John. The Apostle John is well known among all of the apostles because He was the last living apostle. The tradition tells us that he lived to be nearly 100 years old. He had outlived Peter and James and John. He had outlived Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew. He had outlived Matthew and Thaddeus and Simon. He had outlived James and Jude and the apostle Paul. And in his long life, he'd seen a lot of water go under the bridge. He had seen a lot of things happen. He had seen a lot of people come and go. 
And near the end of his life, he sat down to write a letter to the church that he was a part of, the church at Ephesus. The church whose letter Paul wrote to them, you've been studying about. You know about that church at Ephesus long after Paul was dead. Many years later, John sits down to write a letter to these precious people. And the very heart of the letter is the section that we want to look at today. He wrote them a letter, and in essence, what he was trying to say to them is always remember and never forget it's all about love. Look at what the Apostle John wrote 2,000 years ago in the heart of his letter to these precious people he loved so much. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 21. He wrote, Beloved, let us love one another for Love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that he sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and he sent his Son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent the son as the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, and that we have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. And there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must also love his brother. Love, 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 27 times in the passage we just read, you find the word love. You know, there is in a chapter in the Bible that many people call the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In that chapter, you only find the word love nine times. But here you find it 27 times. You find the word love in this chapter more than you find it in any other chapter in the Bible. And the old man John is saying, it's all about love. When you boil it all down, the most important thing I could ever say to you, the most important thing I could ever leave with you as an old man before I go from heaven to earth is this, it's all about love. But what's so profound, what's so wonderful, what's so amazing about what John writes is that he speaks about three kinds of loving. If you are a wise person and you have a pen and a piece of paper in hand, you will jot these things down so you can remember them and you can share them with other people. Because listen, it will get no more important. It will get no more important than what John says here. He speaks about three kinds of loving. What we could call downward love, what we could call upward love, and what we could call outward love. Downward love, upward love, and outward love. 
The first kind of loving that John speaks about is what we could call downward love. God's love for you and me. That's where it all starts. Doesn't get any more profound than that. The downward love, verse 9 and 10. Look at it again. In this, the love of God, the downward love, in this the love of God was manifested toward us that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation, to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin. This love of God for you and for me, that's where it all begins. If you don't understand about the love of God, you don't understand the Bible, you don't understand anything about God. And this downward love of God is all over the Bible. Jot down Romans 5 and verse 8, which says, But God demonstrated his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jot down 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God in Christ. And John 3, 16. For God so Love the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The most profound thing your mind will ever know is that God loves you so much he would sacrifice his son for you. It's the kind of love that is vividly, powerfully, unforgettably illustrated in the true story of a father whose name was John Griffith. Many years ago, in the beginning of the last century, there was a young man, his name was John Griffith, and he married a beautiful young lady, and they had a little boy, his name was Greg, and life was great and wonderful for them. They lived in Oklahoma, and things were great. But then, in 1929, the stock market crashed, and down, crashing down with it came all the hopes and dreams of John Griffith. He lost everything. To be able to provide for his family, he moved from Oklahoma back east, and he got a job on the Mississippi River as a bridge control operator. There was a drawbridge that was there, and what would happen is he would sit in the control room, and he would raise the bridge so that the ships could go down the Mississippi River, and then when they had gone through, he would lower the bridge so that the trains could go across the bridge, and he did that day after day, and life was good again. His young son, Greg, was about eight years old. And one day, his young son said to him, can I go with you to work? I want to go see what you do. Daddy, 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 please. And so they packed up a lunch and off to the bridge they went. And all morning long, young Greg is watching his dad work the controls. And he's thinking in his mind, wow, my dad is the greatest dad in the world. John Griffith had just raised the bridge for a number of ships to go by, and he looked down, and it was about lunchtime, so he locked the control levers into position, and he said to his son, let's go, let's go have some lunch. And so they walked down some, uh, 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 a ladder into this observation deck, and they sat there eating lunch together, and they were just having such a wonderful time. When all of a sudden, the shriek of a train whistle shocked John Griffith back into reality. He looked at his watch. He realized, oh no. At 1.07, the Memphis Express would come roaring out of the woods to cross the bridge, but the bridge was up. He needed quickly to get the bridge down or 400 people on the train would go to a watery grave there in the river. He looked at his young son, Greg, and he said, stay right here, son. Daddy will be right back. He scampered up the ladder into the control room, 
to lower the bridge down. And as he had been trained to do, he looked down before he lowered the controls. And when he looked down, no, it couldn't be. Somehow his young son Greg had tried to follow his daddy up the ladder and he had slipped and fallen off the observation deck. And his tiny body was wedged in between the gears of that bridge. The train whistle shrieked again and John Griffith had moments to decide what to do. Save the life of his son and then 400 other people would die or push the controls and sacrifice his son for all of those people. He buried his tear-filled face in his shoulder and he pushed the controls. They slowly lowered the bridge. He sacrificed his son so all of those other people could live. And dear ones, I'm here to tell you today that is but a faint picture of what it cost God the Father to sacrifice His only begotten Son for you and for me. The hymn writer wrote, The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair, Adam and Eve, bowed down with care. He gave his son to win his erring child. He reconciled and pardoned from their sin. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill? And every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. O oh, love of God, how rich, how pure, how measureless, how strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints. And angels song, the love of God, the love of God, the love of God. It all begins with the love of God. It's as if John says, don't ever forget, God loves you. But downward love will lead to upward love. Because the minute you realize, the minute you keep thinking about how much he loves you. You will want to love him. Look again at this passage. Look in verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. Upward love. The downward love of God is all over the Bible. And the upward love we ought to have for him is also all over the Bible. Jot down Deuteronomy 11 and verse 1. The Bible says, Therefore love the Lord your God and walk in all of his ways. Psalm 31, 23. Love the Lord your God, all you his saints, for the Lord our God is faithful. In Mark 12 and verse 30, Jesus said, and you shall love the Lord your God. You shall love him with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength. And how, listen, how could we not love God for what he's done for us? How could we not love Jesus for saving us? This kind of upward love we ought to have for God. This upward love we ought to have for Jesus is the kind of love a young woman named Debbie Williams had for her jump master, Gregory Robertson. It was April 17, 1987. 
which, by the way, happened to be, just happened to be, a Good Friday. And Debbie Williams and a half dozen of her friends jumped out of a plane at 12,000 feet above the desert near Phoenix, Arizona. They were skydivers, and they were set to join together in a mid-air formation. They jumped out of the plane, but Debbie miscalculated her descent. And at 9,000 feet, she slammed into another diver at 50 miles an hour. The impact, the impact of her head on that other diver sent her falling, falling, falling like a limp rag doll toward a certain death. As she began to fall, her jump master, Gregory Robertson, he saw the blood all over her face as she was dropping. He realized what was going on, and instantly he went after her. He went into what's called a no-lift dive. He tucked his chin down into his, his chest. He put his arms at his side, and down and down he went after her at 180 miles an hour until he caught up with her, grabbed a hold of her, yanked the parachute at just 2,000 feet above the the ground, and they both floated to safety. Later, when Debbie became conscious and they described to her what happened, she was forever grateful to her jump master because he saved her life. And how could we not love our Savior? We were falling, 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 all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But then just as we were ready to make certain, meet certain destruction, Jesus res rescued us. He reached out his hand in goodness and grace and mercy and brought us out of that place. He saved us. I like a song by Tommy Walker. A song called, How Could I But Love You? How could I but love you? How could, how could I but follow you? How could I but serve you, my Lord? In the day, in the day of Calvary Chapel in the Jesus People Movement, we used to sing a little chorus, I like it so much, called The Greatest Thing. It just had these words. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. I want to love you more. I want to love you more. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. And the old man John said, when I'm gone, here's what I want you to remember. I want you to remember that God loves you. He loves you so much. And I want you to remember you ought to love him because he first loved you. But there's a third kind of love that John speaks about. And that's an outward love. You see, downward love will lead to upward love, which will lead to outward love. Because when you, when it fully dawns on you how much God loves you, and your heart is tender and open, and you say, Lord, the greatest thing in all my life is loving you. I want to love you more. All of a sudden, you're going to hear a voice from heaven and say, then love those who are around you. This is what John is saying. Look again at our passage. Look again at verse 11. He says, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. The downward love of God is all over the Bible. The upward love we ought to have for God is all over the Bible. And the outward love is all over the Bible. Like in John 15 and verse 12, Jesus said, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. I sacrificed for you. Now you need to sacrifice for others. I laid down my life for you. Now you lay down your life for others. 
in 1 John 3 and verse 11. This is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. 1 John 3 and verse 16, and this is love since he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for one another. The kind of outward love I'm talking about is vividly illustrated in the story of a little boy named Johnny. There was an old farmer, and out on his farm he had a big dog, and the big dog had puppies. And so he put a sign out on the mailbox on the rural street, puppies for sale. He was out working in the yard when all of a sudden he felt a tug at his pants. He looked down, and there was a little boy named Johnny, and Little Johnny said, Mr., I want to buy one of your puppies. <laughs> and the old man looked, the old farmer looked at a little boy and said, uh, you know, I don't think you have enough money to buy one of, one of the puppies. They, they, they're going to cost too much. You don't have that kind of money. And so the little boy digging around in his pocket, he pulls out his hand. He says, uh, I have 37 cents. Is that good enough for a look? <laughs> and so the farmer, he said, Okay, and so he whistled, help. He said, hello, Dolly. And all of a sudden, this big dog, Dolly, comes out of the, down the ramp of this doghouse, and in behind Dolly are these four little fur balls. <laughs> They're following the dog down, and then, then all of a sudden, a fifth puppy came down. But this puppy wasn't like the other four. This puppy was much smaller and weaker. It was the runt of the litter. The little boy's watching the dogs come down the ramp and the instant he sees that fifth little dog, he says, that's the one. I want that one. I want that puppy. And the old farmer said, no, 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 you don't even have enough money in the first place. But even if you had money, that's not the one you want. That That's the run of the litter. That That, that puppy can't run with you. It can't play with you. It, you, you don't want that puppy. And the little boy said, oh, no, that's the one I want. And then all of a sudden, the little boy, he reached down and he pulled up his pant leg. And underneath his pant leg, there was a huge brace. The little boy was crippled. And the little boy looked up in the face of the farmer. And he said, you know what? I don't run so well either. He said, but my daddy loves me. And I want to love that puppy like my daddy loves me. See, if we love God because he loves us, you can hear him say back to you. You hear it? That love those around you. Love that person on the right. Love that person on the left. Love that person in front of you. Love that person in behind you. Love that person in the grocery store. Love that person in your neighborhood. Love that person on your job. Show the love of God. See, this is what this is what the world is looking for. This is what the world is longing for. To see the love of God in action. In February, I was privileged to be a part of a very important meeting here in the United States of America. A meeting out at the prestigious Pepperdine University. Some of you know the name George Barna, there is a man named George Barna who is the foremost researcher on religion and churches in America. And for six years, they did a study on pastors and the churches in America. It is the most extensive study done on the church in America ever. And in February, I was invited with three other, 300 other pastors and leaders to go to Pepperdine and hear the results of their study. Uh, for four hours we sat there, man, I felt like I was drinking water out of a fire hydrant. I mean, there was so much information. But one of the most significant parts of the morning was the section where they described the attitude of the upcoming generation toward the church. And they asked the key question in so many church leaders' minds, how to reach the millennial generation. How are we going to do that? And so what they had done is rather than, you know, what sometimes happens is a bunch of old guys just sit around and tell you what they think should happen. 
they went out and asked the millennials, what do you want? What is it that you're looking for? And as they began to research among the millennials, what they discovered surprised all of them. All of them. And that was probably the main reason why they even did the seminar to present their findings. What they did as they started interviewing thousands and thousands of millennials, they identified the 250 churches in America that are doing the best job in reaching the millennials. And in their mind, they're thinking the way you reach them is to be relevant, hip, and cool. You have cutting edge music and all kinds of technology and all of that. But what they discovered was just the opposite of what they thought. Because there were some churches that were meeting in these, you know, old storefront inner city buildings packed out with millennials. There were churches that were singing only hymns. They had no guitars or drums or any of that kind of stuff. Packed out with millennials. They found very conservative churches with, you know, old pastors and everything. Packed out with millennials. And they're thinking in their mind, why are these people coming? What's, what is drawing these young people? They identified what they believed was probably the most effective church, a church in Indiana. And they started asking questions among millennials. What brings you to church? And almost every one of them said, Bill. It's Bill. <laughs> it was Bill. Oh, they were curious. They had to meet Bill. <laughs> so they set up a meeting to meet with Bill. <laughs> and they thought, you know, he's going to come in young, hip, cool, skinny jeans, all these things, you know. <laughs> and in walks this 70-year-old man who's as uncool as you can imagine. But he loved them. He loved them. Kind of reminded me when I heard it. Kind of reminded me of an old man named Chuck Smith who loved the hippies. He didn't grow his hair long and wear bell bottoms and all that kind of stuff to reach them. He wasn't trying to be young, hip, and cool. He just loved them. And the line of the day, you're going to leave today and not forget it. The line of the day was this. Love is the new cool. Actually, it's the old cool. Because the Apostle John, when he was an old man, he would sit out in the congregation of the church at Ephesus, that letter you've just been studying. He would sit in the congregation of the church at Ephesus. The pastor of that church was a young man named Timothy. And the tradition tells us every once in a while, John would kind of wave his hand, and Timothy would say, John, do you have something to say? And the people would help this old, aged, frail man to his feet. And he would say, little children, love one another. Little children, love one another. That is all. And he would sit down. And how true. If you understand how much God loves you. And you want to love him back. Then the best way you can do that. Is to love those people who are around you. Downward love. Leads to upward love. Which leads to outward love. You see. It's all about love. The kind of love that was demonstrated by a young junior high kid named Billy in a way that his counselors and all the kids at the youth camp that he went to never, ever forgot. His counselor tells the story. I finish with it. He says, I was asked to be a counselor at a junior high camp Everybody ought to be a counselor at a junior high camp at least once in their life. <laughs> As you might know, a junior high kid's concept of a good time is picking on people. And at this camp, there was a little boy who was suffering from cerebral palsy. His name was Billy. And there were a group of boys who decided they would make fun of him. 
They decided they would pick on him. And oh, how they picked on him. As he walked across the camp with his uncoordinated body, they would line up and imitate his awkward movements. I watched him one day as he was asking for directions. Which way is the snack shop, he stammered. And the boys mockingly imitated him. It's over there, Billy. And then they laughed. They laughed at him. But it all reached a high point on Thursday morning. It was Billy's cabin's turn to give devotions. And I wonder what would happen because they had voted for him to give the devotions. And I knew that they had done it because they just wanted to get him up there and to make fun of him. As he dragged his way to the front, you could hear the kids giggling all over the room. Little Billy stood in front of them. It took him almost two minutes to say ten words. Little Billy said, Jesus loves me. I love Jesus, and I love you. And when it was finished, there was a dead silence, and every junior high kid in the room was bawling. And things were never again the same at that camp. Billy had taught us all a lesson, the most important lesson of all, the lesson of love. Vision City Church, I love your pastor. Vision City Church, we love you. And I can think of nothing more important I could ever impress on your mind and heart than what John impressed on the mind and heart of the believers in his day. And that is, always remember and never forget, it's all about love. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for our study today. We thank you for this simple yet profound passage of Scripture. So basic, and yet we never, ever get beyond it. Lord, I thank you for Vision City Church. You've put these people in this community, in this place, in this time, in human history for a reason, because you want them to be a place where this community knows about your love. And for every one of us today, we just want to say thank you for reminding us of downward love, how much you love us, Lord. And Lord, we want to love you back. We don't come today because we're forced to go to church. We have to go to church. We don't come because we're trying to earn good points. We, we just come, Lord, because we love you. We love you so much, and our hearts are filled with gratitude. Oh Lord, we pray you would teach us to love others, to love our family, to love our friends, to love those people here in this room, to love our neighbors, to love the people we work with, the people we go to school with, to love our enemies, to love the unlovely. Lord, I thank you so much for Pastor Garrett and for this church. Amazing place. But I pray, Lord, of all the things this church would be known for, not just that God, an awesome pastor who teaches the Word of God in such a remarkable way and 
just such incredible worship and great children's program and all these things that are so wonderful. We thank you for them. But above all of that, I pray, whenever someone walks into this room, all of a sudden, they would feel love. Your love. And the love of these people. Lord, we pray you would bless us if we just take a moment right now to worship you.